So Warhammer 40k is pretty famous for having a lot of needlessly dark stuff, like an entire legion of space marines that have a certain fixation with collecting the skins of their victims, to the dreaded demon Kalaba. And do yourself a favor, don't Google it. It's just going to ruin your day. Sometimes when I'm reading the descriptions of these weapons, it occurs to me that there's an author out there somewhere who had to write all this stuff. And the only thought that comes to mind is, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Is everything good, you Gucci fam? I feel like governments put me on a watch list just by Googling this stuff. Now, all that being said, I kinda sorta love all of that edgy stuff. It's so cartoonishly dark that I just can't get enough. So today we're gonna be talking about 10 more needlessly dark weapons from the 40K universe. From guns that strip you apart molecule by molecule like a reverse 3D printer, to a demonic relic that is so evil that just the slightest tap from it will make the target immediately wish for death. But first a quick word from this video's spawn Monster, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grim dark. Stay tuned. Taking this list off at number 10, we have 40K's iconic chainswords. So a chainsword is exactly what you think it is. It's pretty straightforward in its brutality, but unlike a normal chainsaw, the teeth of these things are often monomolecularly sharpened, meaning that every tooth is impossibly sharp. They are designed to rip and tear through the enemy, shredding armor and dismembering the wielder's opponent in as gruesome a display as possible. Blood and armor fragments fly everywhere, while the roar of the sword sends a haunting warning to all of those within listening range. Now seeing your comrade get sliced in half is one thing, but seeing them get killed by a chainsaw has got to be way more horrifying. The idea of fighting a space marine is scary enough, but a thick ass boy flailing around two chainsaws, screaming for the emperor as he thunders towards you, is downright horrifying. And I know the lore traditionally portrays the space marines as super honorable and heroic, but to the enemy, it's like fighting an entire army of leather faces in power armor. And needless to say, these weapons have an incredibly detrimental effect on enemy morale. The deafening roar of thousands of chain swords on the battlefield has got to be absolutely terrifying. And at number 9 we have the Grav Guns. And continuing with the trend of a weapon's name spelling out exactly what it does, the Grav Guns literally fire gravity at the enemy. You see, they work by admitting a stream of graviton particles. This warps and manipulates the local gravitational field in the area that the gun is aimed, turning the target's own weight against them. Now, these things have multiple settings, and when used on their most minimum mode, it just causes a rumbling that affects local air pressure, making it difficult to breathe and disorienting the target. On higher levels, it can completely incapacitate a group of enemies that need to be captured alive. Well, when this thing is cranked to its maximum setting, it will crush the enemy into a singularity. Okay, it's not exactly that powerful, but having your weight suddenly multiply by 10 to 100 times can cause an absolutely agonizing death. As all of your bones crack and your organs rupture, individuals in heavy armor suffer a far worse fate, as the thing that once offered them so much protection now becomes their tomb, as they are slowly crushed in from all directions. In at number 8 we have the Synoptic Disintegrator. The Synoptic Disintegrator is a sniper rifle used by a class of Necrons known as the Death Marks. And this thing is insanely effective against humanoid targets. The gun fires a beam of subatomic particles that absolutely wreak havoc on the target's neural system. It causes the molecules in their nerves to become unbound, starting in the brain and then quickly moving through the entire body. One moment you're standing there fighting and the next you've collapsed to the ground as if somebody had just flicked a switch and turned you off. Your entire neurosystem evaporated in an instant with no physical signs of damage to your body. This can leave your comrades incredibly confused, as they have no idea what happened, where the shots came from, or if they're even actually under attack. The death marks are insanely accurate and can even fire the gun while on the move, and due to their incredibly advanced targeting systems, they rarely ever miss. However, that being said, sometimes the shot may hit their mark, but off by a few millimeters. In such instances, sometimes the target actually survives, but they are left in a debilitating vegetative state for the rest of their lives. Coming in at number 7, we have the Necron Gauze Rifles. And speaking of Necron weapons, let's talk about the humble Gauze Rifle. You see, Gauze Rifles are the most common version of Gauze weaponry utilized by the Necrons. However, the Gauze weapons come in many different forms, but they all function in a similar way. You see, these things aren't firing bullets or a blast of energy like other guns, as they actually emit a molecular disassembling beam. The energy created by it quickly disassembles the molecular structure of the target, tearing them apart a single molecule at a time. It's kind of like a reverse 3D printer, and I think it goes without saying that being killed by one of these things is horrifically painful. The Imperium is completely baffled by them, and they have no idea how they work, because by all accounts, the gauze weapons produce so much energy that if mankind was to try to recreate such a device, it would be insanely dangerous for the user, 
and would probably have a pretty likely chance of exploding. Yet to the Necrons, this is their most basic form of weaponry. In the number six spot, we have the Quake Cannon. All right, now to be fair, I did just talk about the Quake Cannon in my Titan deep dive, so I'll keep it short, but I felt like it definitely deserved to be on this list. So the Quake Cannon is an absolutely massive gun that is normally mounted as part of a Titan's weapon system. However, there are some super heavy tanks that have been known to use this as their main gun. And this thing is a fortress killer. It's capable of bringing down massive buildings in a single shot. If the initial impact doesn't destroy the target, then the massive spider webbing of cracks that spill out from the impact site will inevitably tear it apart. But that's not why this gun is so scary. You see, the shells that it fires are made in a pretty ghoulish way. From time to time, the Imperium will initiate what is known as Exterminatus, the killing of a world. Whether that be through orbital bombardment, cyclonic torpedoes, or even virus bombings. When the Exterminatus order is issued, it is basically a death warrant for a planet, and not to mention every living thing on it. Now, when a world is killed in such a way, it often leaves residual energy, which the Mechanicum sends out soldiers to collect. This energy is then diffused into the shells of a quake cannon. So using the remnants of a dead world to power their guns is dark enough as it is. But what makes it really scary is the commonly held belief by the soldiers of the Imperial Guard that when the quake cannon is fired, if you listen closely enough, you can hear the screams of untold billions, the final death echoes of all of those lives lost during the final minutes of a planet's life. Sliding in at number five, we have the Flamers of Zeench. Now there's a lot of different types of flamethrowers in the 40K universe, from the pistol-sized hand flamers to the toxin-spewing plague belchers of the Death Guard. But the flames created by the Flamers of Zeench are probably the most bizarre. When you see artwork of these guys, they're normally billowing out massive clouds of flames to roast and toast the enemy army. But here's the thing about the fire they produce. It's not actually fire at all. What it actually is, is a cloud of change magic. When under the attack of the Flamers of Zinch, all targets in the vicinity immediately begin to mutate and change out of control, as the warping, twisting energies worm their way inside their bodies. And just like the nature of change, the effects are completely unpredictable. They can sprout hundreds of limbs, turn into piles of eyeballs, be turned inside out, or even just explode. The effects are literally limitless, and the target isn't afflicted by a single change, but hundreds if not thousands, almost simultaneously. Their minds, bodies, and souls warping and twisting into ever more horrific amalgamations. This takes place every millisecond they are under the effects of the flamer. It's one of those things that the more you think about it, the more disturbing it gets. In the number four spot, we have the Rod of Torment. The Rod of Torment is a singularly unique relic, wielded by the clone lord himself, Fabius Bile, or Fabulous Bill, as I like to call him. You see, Fabius is a mad scientist. Once the chief apothecary of the Emperor's children, he began a descent into madness as he frantically sought to unlock the secrets of gene manipulation. And by all accounts, he's doing pretty good, as he was able to make a clone of the Primarch Sanguinius and even the Warmaster Horus Lupercal himself. He's also created a new race of humans that are bigger, stronger, and faster than their predecessors. And right now, he's currently spreading them throughout the galaxy. You should definitely check out his trilogy, as I think he's a really awesome character and he's kinda underrated. But anyways, the weapon that he uses is a demon-forged mace, made out of the scepter and skull of a high-ranking demon prince. And this thing isn't really made for killing. Although to be fair, it is technically a big-ass club wielded by a space marine, so you could definitely use it to beat someone to death. But here's the thing about the Rod of Torment. The tiniest tap will inflict absolutely debilitating levels of agony, said to be so painful that the individual will immediately begin to wish for death. And it definitely makes sense for Fabius to use a weapon like this, considering that he's created an army of abominations. How better to keep them in line than through unimaginable cruelty? Now, over the years that Fabius has had the rod in his possession, the weapon has been feeding off of all of the torment that it inflicts. And at this point, it's developed a form of demonic sentience. And just like how it is used against the Clone Lord's underlings to punish and keep them obedient, Fabius must also punish the rod to make sure it knows its place and who its master is. In the number three spot, we have the Animus Speculum. The Animus Speculum is the iconic helmet worn by the Calexus assassins of the Officio Assassinorum, and it's designed not only to inflict agonizing death on the assassins' enemies, but also to keep their allies safe. You see, in this universe, there are what are known as psychers and their polar opposite, blanks. Psychers have an incredibly strong connection to the warp, and thus can utilize its energies to, for lack of better words, cast spells, whereas a blank has no connection to the warp at all and it is said that there is nothing but a black, empty void where their soul should be. Now, all humans have at least some connection to the warp, 
with the exception of these blanks. And just like how there are varying levels of Psyker, from low-level individuals who can kinda sorta read the thoughts of those around them, to omega-level psychers that can bring about the death of an entire planet with their minds. Now the same logic goes for blanks, and the most powerful of which are known as pariahs. Every single Calexus assassin is one of these, and the negative aura they admit is absolutely insane. It admits waves of dread that can cause everyone around them to lose their mind, vomit uncontrollably, or become completely debilitated, sometimes even causing serious injury to themselves as they try to get away from this thing, as the aura they admit cuts everyone around them off from the warp. And that connection is generally considered to be your soul in this universe, so suddenly losing connection to your soul is an unbelievably unnerving experience for most people. However, for psychers, the effects are far worse. Not only is being in the presence of a pariah insanely painful, but it can even cause death if they're exposed to them for too long. The Animus Speculum keeps this negative field in check, limiting its horrifying impact on the assassin's allies, while additionally allowing them to condense all of that energy and fire it through a focused beam out of the helmet's eye lens. And this beam is incredibly devastating. When used against a normal human, it has the ability to burn out their brain in just a second. Where if used against a psyker or even demons, the effect is multiplied to 100 degrees, making it the absolute bane of sorcerers everywhere. In at number two, we have the Drukhari Glass Plague. Now, no list of super dark weapons from 40k would be complete without at least one Drukhari entry. So let's talk about the Glass Plague. So the Glass Plague is a virus that is primarily utilized by homunculi covens. It's a pretty common type of ammunition in their hex rifles, but it's also been scaled up to be used in many different ways, including as a horrific payload in the missiles of their aircrafts. When the virus is inhaled, a chain reaction begins in the victim that starts to make their flesh rapidly turn to a black, glass-like substance. The process of having your entire body turn into glass is incredibly painful, and if I'm being honest, I cannot for the life of me find in the lore how quickly this happens. If it's over in an instant, I mean, that sucks, but there are far worse ways to die. If it takes several minutes, that's absolutely horrifying. What makes the Glass Plague so dark is that it was actually created by, of all people, a dark Eldar artist. He was famous for his sculptures of other Drukhari people that were unbelievably lifelike, and the fact that he crafted them from glass was even more impressive. Now one day, a rival artist academy was sick of him being in the spotlight and staged an attack. When they broke in and smashed many of his creations, the airborne virus was released, turning not just the attackers, but thousands of Comoran citizens that had been visiting the gallery into sculptures for his new exhibits. Later on, the Glass Plague would be confiscated by the homunculi covens and utilized in their new horrific weapons of war. And in the number one spot, we have the Plague Grenades of the Death Guard. Now, just about everything the Death Guard utilize in war is either terrifying or super gross, and the vast majority of the time, both of these titles apply. However, to me, the Plague Grenades, or the Death Heads as they're more commonly known, definitely take the cake for the most gruesome. You see, they aren't just any ordinary grenade. In fact, they're not even really a grenade at all. They're actually the severed head of one of the Death Guard's enemies. After they beat them, they take the head and hollow it out, and then fill it with hundreds of different contagions, poxes, acids, parasites, diseases, and many manner of other gross stuff. They then sew all of the orifices on the head shut, and the neck is sealed with wax, before it is left to quote unquote, ripen. The process of ripening can take many years, and sometimes they're left to age for decades or even centuries. All the while, its contents growing ever more virulent. When the grenade is finally thrown, the head splatters into mushy goop, releasing a cocktail of vile fluids and toxic gases. Its contents are so concentrated and powerful that not only can it bring about a horrifying, disease-induced death to anybody caught in the blast radius, but it even has the ability to rust and corrode armor and vehicles, causing them to age thousands of years in an instant, making these grenades rightfully feared. 